plots we were, we were looking at balances on a particle. So we had ended off the class by, by looking at a problem where we were calculating what the second velocity is of this particle. So there's a velocity downwards of that particle. And it's the net result of three forces acting on it. We have a gravitational force going down in that direction. We have a drag force in the opposite direction. And then we also have the buoyancy of the particle upwards. Now, I had mentioned in the class last week that, that or last time I should say, that, that velocity here, V, that we use in all these equations, this V is the relative velocity. And a bit in our discussion came up, what if the fluid that this particle finds itself in, so the surrounding environment of the air, we considered that initially stagnant, but there's no need for that fluid to be stagnant. Um, it, that fluid itself could be in motion as well. And that fluid could be in motion either in the downward direction or in fact in the upward direction. So consider the following. If that particle is in the fluid and the particle has a terminal setting velocity v in the downward direction, if the fluid surrounding the particle was going at the same velocity in the opposite upwards direction, so the particle's falling down at a velocity v, but if my fluid is counteracting that at that same velocity v, that particle is going to stay absolutely static. If balancing essentially the gravitational force down and the buoyancy and drag forces up, and the particle will stay absolutely still in the fluid. Fall back to particle size diameter. A particle of smaller diameter, what will happen to it in that situation? Yeah, it will start to go up. And particles that are heavier than that, that or larger than that diameter will sink. Okay? So that principle is used in the separator uh, with, a, with the name elutriation. So elutriation is the principle of, that's used, um, oh sorry, this is the principle that's used in the separator that's called elutriation, or an elutriator. And it's one, one common example of that is uh, in garbage separation. So to separate various types of plastic in waste streams, they will use elutriation. Except there the fluid is not liquid, it's, it's air. And so particles of a certain size will, are suspended in the air and, and fly up, and other particles that are heavier fly down and separate down. So they, they will use that, and the velocity that you operate that elutriator at, that upward air velocity, is what's going to decide how much of your particle goes out in the bottom, and how much of your particles, and which particles leave up in the top. Okay, so this principle can be used and that really is just exploiting this relative velocity. So and that relative velocity V is zero. In other words, the fluid's velocity up and the particle's terminal setting velocity is down. That V over there is equal to zero. And you're essentially just balancing gravity and buoyancy. There's no drag on that particle velocity because the particle is now stationary. Okay, so interpret that equation in, in terms of that thought experiment. And that, it's not just a thought experiment. It's an actual real separator that's used. What we're going to consider today, though, is um, where we start to recognize that that ideal behavior of a single particle in, in, a, in a single airstream or a liquid stream doesn't really exist. Okay? We're going to see that uh, the situation in practice is actually quite different. So how is it different? Well, let's take a look here. One of the reasons why we're considering this velocity is because that's our limiting criteria. We need to design our units for the slowest falling particle, or the slower falling particles. We will never design for the slowest because then we'll end up over-designing, but we'll design our systems for the slower of the particles, in other words, the smallest sizes of the particles. Now, let's take a look at the next topic, which is hindered settling. So we've considered unhindered settling, a particle on its own, but particles We'll almost always find we'll find our systems in in a situation where there's a very high concentration of particles around it, and that influences the setting. So this video over here illustrates that a bit. Um, so just visually, we can see these particles moving. Now they're not spherical; they're needle-shaped. 
Uh, so that's the first, uh, first difference. They're needle-shaped particles, and there's a very high concentration of them. Notice also that while the predominant direction is down, we actually do even see upward drafts of um, particles in, in that system over there. Okay, so the, in high concentration systems, we have what's called indensate, and the particles surrounding the, uh, the others will influence the settling rates. And in fact, that settling velocity we calculated uh, from Stokes' law doesn't, doesn't apply anymore. So we're going to see an alternative way to deal with this. Okay, so here's the reasons why our ideal system doesn't behave. Our particles are hindered by others. Our particles are generally non-spherical. Uh, we have very highly concentrated feeds that will form clusters of particles, and those clusters will form an equivalent diameter of particle that's actually larger than the individual particles making them up. So we get faster settling, in fact. Um, having a very high concentration of solids in that will modify the apparent density and the viscosity of the fluid. So last class we had we said that the fluid's density and the fluid's viscosity play a critical role in determining that settling velocity. But if we've got a high concentration of solids, that fluid's viscosity and density become uh, very different from just the pure fluid density and the pure fluid viscosity. Because of this heavy con high concentration of material falling down, we get the displaced li liquid and that has to go up. So that displaced liquid has an upward velocity counteracting our particle set settling. The smaller particles get carried around in the wake of the larger particles. Um, and we also get conditions of where ionized particle surfaces, and we're going to look at that in a minute in, in, um, in another video. So what I'd like to do is this next section, instead of trying to explain hindered settling, and I obviously cannot demonstrate it over here because to demonstrate it we need long periods of time to see settling occur. This guy does a great job of it, so let's listen to him do it rather than me. The red's the biggest, the blue's intermediate, and the yellow's the smallest. And basically they're settling without any interference with each other, which is why we say free settling. Hands at low concentrations. Uh, if we move up above a concentration of about 1% by weight, then we move into hindered settling. We can see now we have the red, the yellow, and the blue particles again. But they're not settling like they were in free settling. They're settling what's called on mass. They're, they're settling under what's called hindered settling. And if we were to trace the interface, that's the boundary between the settling solids and the completely clear liquid called the supernatant that's left behind, then that interface plotted against time looks like the graph on the right. It's a straight line and then reaches a period where it starts to curve over a little bit and eventually becomes flat and everything's settled out. So that's hindered settling, and that's the classic height against time plot, and it's the plot of the interface during hindered settling. We get a lot of information from that, that plot uh, by careful analysis, and this is the uh, illustration of the zones that occur. There's the interface, interface plot on the left-hand side now, and if we take a fixed point in time, the zones are shown on the right, there's the supernatant, the clear liquid, the original concentration zone, variable concentration zone, and then sediment at the bottom. And that's at a position, fixed position in time, T. And here is some sedimentation. Uh, this is a fairly fast sedimentation, it's normally a, a much slower process than this, and uh, typically performed in batch gels like this, batch <coughs> cylinders like this. The, Good news from the design point of view is that the sedimentation rate is not dependent on the vessel area. So laboratory tests using measuring cylinders are very good for designing industrial things that's much, much bigger. Yeah, that's industrial devices much, much bigger in area for separations. And you can see there is an interface. If we zoom in a little bit, you can probably see that interface a little bit better. There's no here we go, there's a, another shaking up and settling, and 
you can see the interface quite clearly now. The supermates and liquid is not completely clear, but it's, it's not bad. There's just a very, very, very few solids left there. And if we were to plot this against time, we would see that it had a, a straight line, and eventually a curve, and then when it was fully settled, it would just become a plateau. And this is a usually fast sedimenting system. Most things settle much slower than this. Sedimentation is very much light because it's cheap, it's gravity driven, so the energy requirements are, are very minimal. And you can see that we're just, the interface is now just coming below the gradations on the measuring cylinder, and it's pretty much going to finish somewhere around there. So that was a very high concentration. If we had that much lower concentration, it would settle much faster. Here we have uh, a more realistic system. This is uh, gypsum, which is flue gas desulfurization gypsum from power stations. Uh, five measuring cylinders at different concentrations. In fact, the lowest concentration is on the left, the highest concentration is on the right. And we're not going to wait for those to settle. Here they have settled. And you can see that the uh, this isn't fully settled, this is at the same period in time. And on the left we've got quite a low sediment, and on the right we've got quite a high sediment. They're still settling. And if we zoom in a little bit, you will certainly be able to see the clarity of the supernatant. Again, it's not crystal clear, but it's not bad at the higher concentrations. That's the highest concentration on the right, and then those three there are reasonable concentrations. And the two lowest concentrations on the left, you can see clearly that, uh, again, the supermate is not bad, but it's a little bit cloudy. So the key, the key point here is that uh, those, those, when we're in a heated settling environment, we don't see that individual particles settling at the internal settling velocity. In fact, what we get is we get this single interface forming and falling down over time. And so that's in fact what we're going to use to design our processes. We have to resort to lab tests and real samples that match the actual material we'll work with in the future. So that one example, we use gypsum from the desulfurization plant. We use actual samples from the process settle them in the lab, and then use those lab results to design the larger scale units. So let's take a look then at those larger scale units. These operate in continuous mode. So this is very important to distinguish between those cylinder examples. That's a batch process. You put a whole lot of material in the cylinder, shake it up, and watch it settle. So that's a batch process. This is a continuous process, so it's always operating, always settling and you're feeding new material in at the top and taking your solids out. Yeah, I'm just saying, um, the lowest concentration was the most cloudy. Yeah. Because those uh, smaller particles, those fines, don't get cooled down. With the higher concentration, the, the particles cool each other down and they get captured in the way. The smaller particles will stay in suspension and there will be some ground in motion as well. Okay, so in the lab case, um, we, we're watching that interface fall over time in a batch situation. That interface drops with time. On a continuous process, that doesn't happen. There's, we don't see a line of solids and then a line of clear liquid. And that, So here we see that line, but that line doesn't move downwards over time. That line, that interface between the clear zone and this cloudy zone stays at that point because we're always feeding in new material with new solids at the top in the feed, and we're always pulling off solids here at the bottom. So at steady state, that interface between the clear zone and the cloudy zone stays at that particular horizontal level. So the supernatant or the overflow is that clear liquid that's pulled out at the top, and our sludge comes out here at the bottom. So there's a very high concentration of solids, but there's also quite a bit of liquid still in this stream. Okay, so this is not just pure solids, obviously. We need to be able to pump it out. And then that's treated in a secondary step. Our liquid leaving may be mostly clear. There might be some 
small amount of fine particles in that, and then that can get treated in a subsequent step as well. And then we have this rake rotating this, so this is a, uh, a, a circular base, and uh, by and large these are almost always circular units that are used, and that rake is used just to agitate the material. As the rake passes through the solids, it's helping to break up any air bubbles, and it helps the solids pack together a bit closer by breaking them up and allowing the solids to repack and allowing the fluid to leave and, and be expelled up in the upper direction. So let's go back to the batch uh, lab test. As was described in that video, we see this interface coming down at a constant rate. In, in our cylinder, so that this interface between the clear and the cloudy zone moves at a constant rate up to a point. And that's called the critical sedimentation point. This curve that's obtained from the lab test is what's used to design the process. Okay? There's, a, there's a fairly complicated procedure that's followed where that angle of that slope is used um, to design the process. And we don't go into that in, in this course. Um, but the key, that the key thing that I want you to take from this is that we're using laboratory samples that should match the, the material we're trying to treat. What we're going to do is we're going to design the, the size of the unit considering that interface falling at a constant velocity. So we will look at, at a crude approach to sizing these units, but the more detailed approach where we use these laboratory curves um, is not covered here in this course. It's more, more of the domain of civil engineering um, and where you have a professional person uh, work with you on, on designing and sizing that. Okay, go back to last step. Uh, when, when you say critical certification, is this happening? Does it happen when? When you have a new situation? Um, so the critical point happens when this interface comes down and the, so that rate is linear to a point and then it's then, then, then this interface is over here, there's no more, there's no, nowhere else for that interface to go. So all that happens is the solids start to compact. So the rate of that, that interface dropping must slow down at some point. So that critical point is just where that inflection is. And then that curve will change as well depending on the, the concentration of the material we're working with. So dilute, intermediate, and more concentrated. Uh, material will have different settling curves. Again, emphasizing the fact that that sample we use to design our sedimentation unit must be representative of what we're going to experience in the future. Now, what we're most interested in is coming up with the size of these units that will work for the worst case situation. And the worst case situation are particles that are extremely small. The smaller those particles are, the slower they settle, and then the longer residence times we need, and longer residence times imply larger units. Larger units imply greater capital costs and larger operating costs. So what we really want to do is find the key constraint here, and our key constraint is particle size. That's our key variable that's going to influence the settling of uh, of the material. And if we can alter the particle size, we can make our units smaller and spend less money operating them and spend a whole lot of less money building them. So one way to do that is to add chemical additives to the fluid. So that's what's the principle of flocculation. We'll coagulate the particles, in other words, we'll bring multiple small particles together to create a larger particle or particles those will settle at a faster rate and we'll get clearer liquid because those smaller particles now won't stay in suspension. They'll come together and form larger particles and separate out at a faster rate. So again here, MIT has put a great video on that together. Um, so I'm going to show that instead of me trying to describe it. Again, they've got some good demos in here. One thing I want you to pay attention to is track what type of flocculants are used and where in which environments they're used. Also remember now we're adding a material to our separator. So there is a mass separating agent being added here. When we're dealing with water, you want to make sure that that mass separating agent is safe 
for consumption later on. Right? So we, we can't just add any additives, especially if this water is going to be used downstream for uh, consumption purposes. So, so bear that in mind while uh, we take a look at this, um, this video here.
Did you know that Singapore, for instance, produces drinking water from sewer water using the number of methods including flocculation? As the global population increases and fresh water resources become more and more scarce, flocculation is one tool to supply clean, healthy, and tasty drinking water worldwide. So uh, that, uh, that principle that sh was shown there about the flocculants uh, minimizing the thickness of the double layer, that uh, is, a, is a simplified mechanism of understanding it. The mechanism, the chemical mechanisms behind flocculation are fairly complex in, in certain situations. Um, in the mining industry, for example, flocculants are, are widely used um, for separating out minerals and, and they're used in flotation cells as well to modify sur uh, surface chemistry. Well, Pelton's group here at Mac um, does a lot of research, and used to do a lot of research on surface chemistry. So for those of you that are looking at taking uh, Dr. Pelton's course uh, next time, I think it is, that uh, I, I don't know if he still covers these topics, but certainly his research group used to cover it. It's, um, it's a fairly interesting um, and pretty complex uh, mechanisms that take place there. So the, the key result for us, though, in this course is recognizing that once we've added the flocculants, we're forming these larger particles, they're separating out faster. But also, once we start to do that, it's really impossible for us to predict from a theoretical perspective what the shape and size of those new, newly formed particles are going to be. A lot of it depends on the flocculant used, the contacting time, and we really cannot model it from a theoretical first principles. Basis. So again, we resort to these lab experiments where we add flocculants, observe the settling rate as shown there in the video, and we use those settling rates from our lab experiments to design our systems. Now one thing uh, to bear in mind is that when we're adding our flocculants, so here's my, my, my raw flow rate coming in with solids and the liquid, I contact that flocculant usually as an inlet into the pipe just prior to um, entering the sedimentation mix. The reason is the flocculant should not be in contact with it for a long period of time. If I leave the, the flocculant in contact with the material for a longer period of time and then try to flow the material through a pipe or through pumps, I will break up those flocks that have formed. Okay, so the, the main goal is to contact the flocculant just before we put it out into the sedimentation vessel and so it can spread out and settle. If you manipulate that solid material, you'll almost always break up the flocculants. Uh, sorry, break up the flocks. So the, a lot of the design of these units comes on uh, or relies on where you add that flocculant in along the pipe and how you minimize the breakup of the flocks in that uh, entry point over there. So here's one, uh, one interesting way that a company has designed. To minimize that, they have their feed come in with the flocculant, and then they they make it uh, flow counter current to each other, so that that those two velocities kind of cancel each other out, and the fluid immediately loses all its momentum. So you collide two fluid streams into each other, same momentum, and it should uh, cancel each other out, and that material will flow down and start settling with fairly minimal disruption. But there's a there's a number of other ways that one can feed the material into that sedimentation vessel. The key thing is you want to totally minimize any turbulence from your feed on the existing material that's in the sedimentation vessel. So you don't want to disrupt your existing sedimentation. And you don't want to break up any flocks that have formed already. So lab experiments always used to design these units based on the flocculant and on the, on the representative sample of the material we are beginning with. So when we use that word flock, it's the solids with that the flocculant on, on the surface and it's the coagulated particle. So it's the newly formed coagulated particle. We'll refer to it as a flock. So where we're going in this next section is looking at the preliminary design of a sedimentation vessel. 
one thing I want to stress again is that this unit operates at steady state. So my solids coming in at the feed point over there will almost all, all of those solids will leave again in the underflow, in the sludge. We'll have almost no solids leaving in the overflow. The overflow is a pretty clear stream. So separation factor on these units is pretty close to infinity uh, if we're doing a good job of separating out. So, so if we just do a visual mass balance over this unit, I've got my solids coming in here. I've got my feed coming in at flow rate Q. My solids concentration, which we call C0, we'll, we'll find this terminology in the next slide. Here's my overflow, and it's mostly clear. And my sludge or underflow So most of my solids coming in will exit at the bottom out over here. So if I draw this imaginary line, essentially what's happening is yeah, that all my solid particles will at some point pass through this cross-sectional area and then leave out again here at the bottom from a mass balance perspective. Are they added in as solids, like they're not within like a liquid? So it's, it's the solid-liquid mixture coming uh, in here. Yeah. So Q is the flow rate of that feed, the total feed. So Q is meters cube of feed per minute. And C0 is equal to kilograms of solids per meter cube. So the product of Q and C0 will give me my kilograms of solids per minute. But this is a solid liquid mixture coming in over here. My liquid will mostly leave in the overflow. My solids will, all, almost all of it will leave in the underflow, giving me a separation factor close to 100. The key concept we have to understand in order to size these vessels is that this cross-sectional area here in this vessel will see all the solids pass through that hypothetical barrier. So that, that red line that I've illustrated there is a hypothetical line, or sorry, a hypothetical disk shape through which all the solids will pass through at steady state. So whatever kilograms of solids coming in here per minute, kilograms of solids will pass through that unit area, or sorry, through that surface area and then leave through the underflow. So that's the principle we're going to use to design these units. And we're going to call the flow of solids passing through that area the mass flux. So uh, we've seen this term flux in several courses. You've seen it in your heat transfer course. I used it a lot in the reactor design course. You see it here again in this um, context now. So the flux then is defined as the mass flow of solids per unit area. So kilograms solids per second. So mass flow of solids per unit area and we give it the Greek letter psi. And psi can be found as the product then of that terminal settling velocity V, or the velocity of the, the fluid of the material leaving, or settling, I should say, meters per second, is its units, and C0 is kilograms of solids per meter cubed. So uh, this terminology is all on the next slide, actually, for the units and the civil definitions. So when we're designing these units, really what we want, the, the flux is our key variable that we're going to use to size the unit on. Because it's how much solids we have to treat per unit area, and once we know our solids need to be treated per unit area, we can then calculate the corresponding unit area because we know our solids flow. That's a design criteria. Design the unit to remove a certain solids flow rate at a certain kilograms per second of solids, we can then find the corresponding surface area required in the cross section of the Now, this is made or based on this key assumption that no solids leave in the overflow stream, which is a pretty good assumption for most sedimentation vessels.
So if we take a look at that thing, um, at that interpretation, we've got our flux is equal to our mass flow, kilograms of solids, uh, sorry, our, our concentration of solids, kilograms of solids per meter cube multiplied by velocity. There's the other very useful way to interpret flux, and that's the inverse of it, I should say. So flux here, let's just uh, talk of, uh, put up the units just to be clear. Kilograms of solids per unit time, so per second, multiplied by unit area. So solids per unit area. But what's also useful to interpret is 1 over flux. That's the unit area required for a given amount of mass feed. In other words, it has units of meters squared required per kilogram solids per unit of time. So the units of inverse flux are, are very useful as well. What is the surface area I require meters squared to treat a given solid flow rate, kilograms of solids per unit time? We always know that denominator. What is my mass flow? Kilograms of solids per unit time. I know that because I know what my flow rate of my feed is. I know the concentration of what my solids are. The product of that uh, is kilograms of solids per unit time. So I, I always know what that denominator is. Once I know the flux, I can then back calculate what size my vessel needs to be. So that's what, where that first, that first equation up there comes from, is if I know inverse flux is that, if I multiply inverse flux, and sorry, if I multiply Q times C0, Q times C0, that's my mass flow, multiplied by 1 over psi, that will calculate for me the unit area required. And once I have the unit area, I can calculate the diameter of the vessel. Now we can simplify that equation because we know that psi is C0 times the terminal settling velocity. And so summing that into that equation gets me my area as Q, the volumetric feed coming into my vessel, divided by the settling velocity. And so that's why we do our lab tests. The lab test finds me V. Q I know is, is a design variable that I need to um, size the unit for. And once I have Q and V, I can then calculate the size of my vessel. So what I'd like you to do then is consider this problem that's up here next and find essentially what the problem is asking is to find the cross-sectional area required for a vessel. And we're given a whole lot of information up there from the lab test and we're given Q, our flow rate, and we can find the area. Now what I'd like you to do then is at least initially, is not just to substitute in values into that formula and find the area. That's, um, that's given to you, in fact, over there. The area is really just a result of solving the problem. What I'm more interested in is your approach to getting to that point. So go ahead for the next few minutes and, and, and show how that area can be found. But I'd like you to then use that systematic problem-solving strategy we uh, introduced in class a few, few days ago, where you you plan your problem before you go and do it, but prior to that you explore the issues and, the, and the, the physical concepts involved in the problem and define your objectives and what you know and what you don't know. So really, that step is a little further away. So go ahead and define what you know, what you don't know, what your plan would be to solve this, and then if you have time, still go ahead and, and prove that that answer is what I put up there.
for the next two, three minutes, you really don't need to do any calculations. Really what I'm far more interested in is, is really to outline your strategy that you're going to use to approach the problem. So a few confused uh, faces from what I can see. What, uh, what is our objective here? What are we trying to, to head for? The area of the clarifier. Area of the clarifier. So our goal is A of the clarifier. What do we know? So we have info on interface settling. What else do we have? Flow rate. Flow rate. So Q of flow. Yeah. So what is it? What values? Flow rate. One hundred. So 2100 meters per minute or 2.1 meters cubed per minute. Anything else we know? I think we want to overdesign it. We want to overdesign it. So what does that mean right now? What does it mean to overdesign this unit? It's like we're going to design it for something like that. Okay, so we're going to, yeah, so make it work for a large capacity or here, but we've been told to over design based on the settling rate and not on the flow rate. So, yeah, we're going to, essentially what we're recognizing is this unit's going to be larger than it really needs to be. What if we have this, because we're over designed right here, it's going to take twice as long. Right, okay, so are we going to double or are we going to halve, right? And then what are we going to double or halve? Right. So we're not quite sure yet on, on that aspect. Um, Anything else we uh, know? We have a seven meter squared entry area. Okay, so we've got that additional seven meter squared entry area. So here's the unit I'm going to size. It's going to have a certain diameter D, but there's this internal area where we feed the material into that separator, and that has a new seven meter squared surface area. So we need to add an additional seven meters squared onto our tank diameter, uh, sorry, onto our overall area after we've calculated it to account for that seven meters squared that's going to fit there in the middle. So let's say if we design a unit that's 100 meters squared, we're actually going to have to build it to be 107. 
because seven of it's going to be taken away from that key error. Okay, so that's what I know, what I don't know. I would like you to go, and in tomorrow's class we'll finish this problem, but first plan your approach, and then you can go ahead and implement it and see if you can duplicate those values over here. And also attempt part two, but in tomorrow's class we'll take up this problem and finish it and then move on and finish it.